Hi and welcome back to a new video. On this channel we're covering a ton of different cooling solutions. In the past we had everything from dry ice, liquid nitrogen, air cooling, water cooling and also more exotic stuff such as submersion cooling. But what we also didn't cover yet is spray cooling. Here in my hand I have a Cray X1 CPU from 2003. These were used in supercomputers. Up to 512 of those units were forming one of those big Cray supercomputers and they were cooled over spray cooling. And in today's video we do not only want to take a closer look at this module but we also want to build our own spray cooling solution. Thermal Greasy Duronaut is our new high-end thermal paste and the successor of Cryonaut. It's even better performing, it is much easier to apply, it is cheaper and it's much more durable. That's where the name comes from. Especially if you're now maybe considering to buy a new PC, then I would highly recommend that you're looking into this thermal paste. So let's continue with this video. But what exactly is spray cooling? You have an electrically non-conductive fluid and the mist of this fluid is blown directly onto the surface you want to cool. This could be the heat spreader of a CPU or could also be, such in this case with the Cray X1 CPU, the silicon dies directly. Once the mist or the fluid hits the surface and the surface temperature is above the boiling point of the fluid, it will directly evaporate. And for this phase change from liquid to gas, you just need a lot of energy. And this is why this cooling method is so super effective, especially on a very small room. You can remove and cool a lot of heat. And then eventually the gas will then be cooled, will be condensed and then recirculated and then you have like a closed loop. We will now take a closer look at the Cray X1 supercomputer CPU, take it apart and this will certainly help to understand how the spray cooling works. The Cray X1 CPU has a massive stainless steel case, which is also needed for the pressure that might build up. If we turn it around, we can see the electrical contacts that form the connection towards additional PCBs. And then we see this big and thick ceramic package that was often used like 20 or 30 years ago for, for example, also mainframe CPUs. We have a kind of frame on the bottom that we will probably have to open to release the CPU from the, from the bottom. And then we have an inlet and outlet. The small connection right here is the inlet where the fluid will be pumped inwards. And the big portion right here is the outlet where the gas or the evaporated fluid will come out. So we will first just remove the screws on the outside. So that's our supercomputer CPU. I'm not quite sure if it's an 8-core or 4-core CPU. We have at least 8 dice. Could also be 4 cores and 4 times cache. That would be kind of plausible, I think. And then around it, this is some kind of a gasket to seal it off to the case. Now here you might be able to see all the fluid nozzles. So for example, here is a tiny hole and here and here and here. And these tiny nozzles or holes are made to direct the fluid directly onto the chips. And this is quite critical when it comes to how these CPUs work. So this has to be super precise in terms of the amount of fluid that gets through, the pressure, the direction and everything, the amount of holes has to be perfect to make sure that all of these individual chips are just like fully covered by the mist, by the fluid and also in the right amount. This point is the fluid inlet, which is much smaller than the outlet. And the reason for that is that once a fluid evaporates, it just expands much more in volume. That's why you just need more volume, more size for the gas to be able to exit the CPU. And this is the counterpart where you have a small hole in the corner. That's where the fluid would enter. And inside this thing, you would have the fluid channels and the fluid channels would direct the fluid towards the small nozzles, the small holes, you might be able to see on here. And just by investigating these parts, you might get an idea of how complex a spray cooling in the end will be. Starting from the pump, the fluid, and just sealing everything off perfectly to the part where the gas just condenses and is recirculated and all that, is just super complex. The most important part about the entire concept is the fluid which has to be special in terms of being ideally non-electrically conductive, non-toxic, non-flammable and it should have a low boiling point. And most of these properties can be found in fluorinert fluids, so they contain fluor. That is something you might know from previous projects such as those submersion cooling systems with 3M Novik. 
And it's very important to select the right boiling point because the boiling point of the fluid will determine the operation temperature of your components, such as the CPU. For example, if you pick one with 60 degrees Celsius, then you won't be able to reach an operation temperature of your CPU below that because the fluid will hit the surface and once the CPU reaches 60 degrees Celsius, the fluid will start to evaporate and the component will stay at this temperature as long as you have a constant flow of fluid that is hitting the surface and you always have the constant evaporation. Common fluids from the daily life that might be suitable for uh, spray cooling could be IPA that has a boiling point of about 82 degrees Celsius or acetone with a boiling point that is fairly low with about 56 degrees Celsius. But since they are carbon hydrates, they have the property of being super flammable and it's something you just want to avoid. 3M Novec are hydrofluor eaters. And for example, compared to acetone, you also have carbon, oxygen and hydrogen, but also you have the presence of fluor. And this gives it very special chemical properties. It's not electrically conductive and it's also non-flammable. And depending on your molecule length, you can also control the boiling point. For example, with 3M Novec 7000, you have a boiling point of only 34 degrees Celsius. All these properties make this kind of fluid perfect for what we want to try today. But it's a very special fluid, something you can't simply by. And it also will be banned by the end of the year, at least here in the EU. But that's something we will talk about later. And for this spray cooling experiment that we want today, I ordered a bunch of pneumatics components that we will definitely need. I will not be able to make the full concept of condensation and recirculating and everything, so I will just focus on the cooling part with spraying and cooling. I bought this tiny pneumatics vaporizer and that's what I'm planning to use. We have two connections on here. Connection number one is just the air pressure connection to is going to be the fluid. The fluid will be connected in just a simple reservoir. That's what I want to fill. And then through Venturi effect, the fluid will be pulled in and then vaporized through the nozzle on top. And this will be able to control how much fluid we want to have in the mist or how much fluid we want to have vaporized. And then just a bunch of fittings that I will need just for making all the tubing and stuff. This is a system I'm planning to use with the 9800X 3D, already added a small arm for the reservoir to mount and this arm will be to add the vaporizer and then it should just spray down onto the CPU and cool it. Already have the reservoir mounted and also the fluid connection towards the vaporizer. To be honest, I'm not sure if vaporizer is the correct English term or if it's atomizer or just spray unit or something. Uh, let me know if it was incorrect. I'm so curious if this will work, even if this is pretty simple. So we have pressure supply on the right, small pressure control valve, just something to open and close, pressure gauge, and that's basically it. We have our small vaporizer, and now I will add some of the 3M Novik into the small bottle, so we can put it into the reservoir, and that should be it in theory. First look almost looks like water, it's just a lot more liquid. Oops. Well, uh, it's good that the fluid is not conductive and I think I might have a leak down there. I reassembled it, also added another seal on the bottom. That looks quite a bit better, so I can't see anything where it's leaking. I also added a small temperature probe on the side of the heat spreader that should be able to give us an idea of the heat spreader temperature and what we can read out. And first we will start the system just with gentle amount of air pressure, but without the fluid. We'll just start it and see how it's going. I could already see some drops coming out of it. So I will probably just start the pressure, air pressure, and then we see how it goes. You can't see that much. There's a bit of like fluid residue on the surface. But we already have a quite cool CPU, literally. And I'm also using the internal GPU of the Ryzen 9800X 3D so we have more space on the system. And now that it's running, we can also drastically see a temperature increase on the heat spreader. Might be able to see how the fluid is coming out there. The system has been running for a couple of minutes and obviously usually without a heatsink you would be happy to just be able to enter windows and for me this has been running fine for a couple of minutes now and the heat spreader temperature is still 
I would say in an okay range. But you can also clearly see the difference to the core temperature. So core temperature in our case currently with about 50 watts of power draw is maybe around 60 to 70 degrees Celsius overall. So it's, it's like idle, not super idle, it's doing something with 50 watts, but at least so far it's working and running. Also interesting, you can see some small ice crystals building up on the nozzle of our spray cooling, probably because the fluid directly evaporizes and that is also taking up quite some heat. We now have a temperature of about 30 degrees Celsius on the CPU and I would now try to run Cinebench. The CPU temperature is definitely increasing quite a bit. We see uh, 53 degrees Celsius on the heat spreader. But so far, yeah, it passed. Awesome. We can see 18,000 points, which is a little bit less than it should be on stock, probably because it hit 95 degrees Celsius at some point, but at least it passed. There is a significant amount of ice building up. You can still see the fluid hitting the IHS. I'm just emptying this reservoir, which I think overall I consumed about 500 milliliters in 15 minutes, but it definitely worked. Fluid is now empty and you can straight see how the temperature rises. So it's clear that the fluid is absolutely needed and without fluid, just with air pressure, you can't get anywhere. I'm also pretty sure if this is done correctly and engineered correctly, like with this kind of supercomputer, then you will have a much better performance than what we saw with this. Like it was just to show the principle of how a spray cooling works. But if it hits, for example, the dice correctly with the right pressure, with the right amount of fluid, with the right type of fluid, I'm pretty sure it would work much better than what we saw here. But at least it was working with something very improvised. The biggest problem, as I said in between, is the fluid. 3M Novak is hydrofluoroether, and these days is also classified as PFAS. So that's also known as a forever chemical. A chemical that's not really biodegradable, so it will stay forever out there in the environment and also probably in the human body, might cause damage to both. That's something that is also partially unknown, partially known, and that's one of the reasons why these kind of fluids are now under the PFAS regulation. And that's also, at least officially from what I read, the reason why 3M stopped or at least at the end of the year will stop making these kind of fluids. So it will definitely be a challenge to find alternatives that will match the same kind of criteria as a fluid. But in the end, it's also something that you wouldn't find in your ordinary consumer system or even high-end servers. I think it's more likely to just see normal fluid, normal water cooling systems. But it's still a technology that was used in supercomputers, might still be used these days if the supercomputers are still running, and it might still be used in very specific applications where you have to dissipate a lot of heat on a very tiny space. That's where spray cooling might still be something cool. And I hope you enjoyed this video, learned something new. See you next time. Bye-bye.